hope you enjoyed the little soundtrack we just played. It's to the new television series, Phenomena Project. Well, we're hoping so. Anyway, we've been in contact with the gentleman that wrote the, the, the song, uh, which is called Fire, and it's very befitting for this particular series. Uh, my name's Steve Miller. For those that don't know me, I've been involved in the subject of UFO investigations, primarily. My first investigation of a UFO was in, back in 1983 in Liverpool, so 34 years in the field. And uh, around about uh, 1990s, the late 1990s, I got involved in the paranormal research, uh, psychology, parapsychology, and we kind of moved forward since then. But I'm here today to talk to you about a new television series. Now, this is no ghost hunting, ghost busting TV show that we see on television. Yes, there are plenty of them, and uh, it's certainly not like the, the typical things you'd often see. There are no hoaxing, that's good. Uh, there is uh, literally evidence you are going to see in this TV series, tests that have been carried out, and yes, to substantiate that things really do bump in the night. Phenomena Project, it's its name. <clears throat> it's sponsored by Olympus, which is really good because they provide us a lot of really nice equipment. <laughs> And um, we set it out for review in, 19, in 2015. We, po we posted some information out around the world to see what the response was in regards to small trailers of the episodes that we put out. These are some of the responses that we got. The examiner.com went out to 60 million people in the US. And they said uh, a new TV documentary could blow the lid off the best kept scientific secrets that's what we're really getting at is that we do believe that there is some form of suppression we're going going on regarding scientific establishments not releasing what we refer to as the real evidence of the existence of paranormal phenomena the mirror also uh, we're very pleased with it reporter Mike Lockley on location said phenomena project I've never seen anything like it it's quite frankly I'm stuck for words. Which is that's very good. It's not often the mirror is stuck for words. <laughs> uh, editor and author Brian Allen um, said Steve Meritine's up with Don Phillips. The setting could be explosive. Well, yes, it has been on occasion. So, SCP, the Scientific Establishment of Parapsychology. This is the investigation that took place last year in Seattle, Washington, in the USA. We were called there to investigate claims of paranormal disturbances at a house it's only 10 years old it also already been featured in newspapers on the television fox news K uh, como 4 and uh, we thought that there was something to it however um, there had been a lot of debate about this and it became quite notorious as being the most debated story regarding paranormal phenomena in america of 2016 New at six, burning Bibles, disappearing crosses, shaking chandeliers. They sound like scenes from a Halloween horror movie, but a Bothell man says these are happening in his haunted home. Como 4's Elisa Jaffe shows us what he considers proof and the moment that our cameras caught too. This is not a Casper type ghost. And this is no ordinary Bothell house. Table walked in, the table's on the floor. When Keith and his girlfriend moved in two years ago, he says strange things started happening right away. First thing we heard on day one was a kid cough coming from upstairs. They don't have kids. But this IT guy did have cameras and started documenting disturbances. Keith claims items started moving, flying and disappearing. There are candles missing. One candle just got thrown and there are two candles missing. Every cat in the door is wide open. All of them open up and down. There's no, there's no way that could be. I left a cat in the door open. That's it. That's it. What was that? That's it. It does not like cameras. I'm, I'm telling you, that, that's it. We shared Keith's videos Let's with share. paranormal investigator Dave Schrader of Darkness Island. Radio. Skeptical, yet it is intriguing. There are a few scenes. Everything seems to be happening off camera. So automatically I begin to question just because I've been in the position of a lot of people trying to fool the ghost hunter. Keith says he's tried crucifixes and prayers, holy water and olive oil, but Bibles still burn. 
open like this on fire. He says the last family that lived here only lasted five months. It was living hell here. So why doesn't he leave when whatever it is won't leave him alone? He says he hasn't exhausted his resources yet and believes there's no guarantee that when he goes, the hauntings won't follow. You don't know where the next thing is coming from. In Bothell, Elisa Jaffe, Como 4 News. Key says he's also now working with a priest to find peace in his home. And the paranormal researcher Elisa interviewed offered to hook Keith up with the Ghost Adventures crew. Now, this was not good for Keith or his partner, Latina. They basically came out. This is the um, a little bit of information regarding an email between them, that exchange between Keith Linder, the owner of the property, and Ghost Adventures. And you can see they were asking about when can they come and film. Now Keith, at that moment in time, was trying to get contractors in to fill up the holes in the wall because projectiles had literally flung themselves across the room and buried themselves in the wall. And at that point, Keith was having to pay 300 and odd dollars for a guy to come out and skim over them. And what the Ghost Adventures team said, can you hold off the, the guys that are going to come in and repair the walls? We'd like to film that as part of the TV series. So Keith was kind of holding off on the contractors coming in. But what is interesting, if you, if you recall, Keith was laying out a lot of money out of his own pocket to repair the wall. Now, if anybody's going to fake something, then why would you do so if it's going to cost you $300 at each time when you put a hole in the wall to be skimmed over? With, uh, with plaster, and it, interesting. Of course, Zach Baggins turned up with his team and he were there for four, I believe four hours himself, uh, during one evening. Also, they asked the, uh, the owners of the home, Keith Linder and his partner, Tina, to leave the house, to vacate the house and go and stay in a hotel for the evening. Now, we always argue the point, if paranormal phenomena is taking place whilst a couple are there and you want to witness paranormal phenomena, then why change the environment? If you want to try and capture something, then you want it in the same conditions as it normally would be, which just means that the pet, the, the, they actually would be there, staying there the night. But uh, that wasn't the case. And at the end of the TV episode, and you can see this in season 10, I believe, called, they've named it Demons in Seattle. What a fantastic name. Of course, there were no demons. I think the only truth of the matter is, is that it actually was in Seattle, and that's about it. Uh, they said they found no evidence. Now, it's what after this happened was they put out suggestions in a way that they may have been responsible themselves. That didn't go well for Tina. It didn't go well for Keith. They got a lot of hate mail in emails. And basically what happened was it caused the device of their relationship. Tina was so stressed with, the, with it all, she actually left Keith, left the house. Keith was very upset. Now, as you can well imagine, he wanted vindication. And when he contacted SCP over here in Manchester, he said, well, you know, guys, it, it's legitimate. I don't know what else to do. The, the TV show contacted me. They came in. They, didn't, they said they didn't find anything. I don't know why. It's ridiculous. But it looks like we've been scorned. It looks like that we've been pointed at and blamed that we might be faking this, and we haven't, and completely sincere. Our response to Keith at that time was, well, Keith, we'll, uh, we'll look into it. And we did. And we questioned Keith over a period of four months. Repeated questions, psychoanalysis. This was done over Skype, so we could see the video pictures of him, so that we could judge his response to questions. Eye oscillation, stance, attitude, behavior. A lot of those things are noted when looking for sincerity. And on a tick sheet and a pointing system that we often use, he scored relatively high. We do believe he was actually being sincere. And that's the only reason why we decided to take this case, because from what was being put out, it was a little bit too too much to believe, to be honest, with some of the things that have been reported. Nevertheless, it did seem to show sincerity, so we did decide to visit Seattle. Beautiful place, Seattle. If, if anybody's ever been, you'll probably notice the absence of small pets, and that's because there's a lot of big eagles around, and that's the truth. You, you whip up pets and take them off, and not to be seen again. So, But it is a lovely place. The, um, the weather there is no much different than it is here in Manchester. You know, yes, it pretty much rains most of the time. That's, we do call it uh, uh, a very wet location. But it's, uh, it's very vast. See, it's Mount Rainer in the distance. And, uh, and of course, from Seattle, the main city, you can see the Space Needle. 
which is a, a very large rotating type building, uh, ro uh, like a restaurant. This is the house. Now, the first thing you notice straight away, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a lovely home. Sorry. It's a lovely home. And um, it's only 10 years old. It's only 10 years old. It's, it's pretty much new. The whole area is only 10 years old. We've around about 68 houses on the development. And um, it's 283 square feet. Uh, it's got five bedrooms, uh, an ensuite, and a main bathroom. Uh, lovely house, lovely home, lovely area. And the first thing I noted when I pulled around the corner into this estate was how much it looked like the suburban um, location seen in the Poltergeist movie right at the beginning. It was just prequely the same. Kids playing on bikes. It was, it was lovely, lovely place. But inside was a different story. This is what was being reported. Things being completely trashed. This was happening when Keith was even at work. He'd come home, he'd find his office completely trashed. Things turned upside down, no explanation for it. He did have an alarm system, ATC alarm system, which was home monitored and remote monitored. And uh, he didn't have any intrusions into the home, yet these disturbances happen on a regular basis. And as you can see, it's quite destructive. He also found things scattered around in the kitchen, the pantry door open, and as you can see, cupboard doors, drawers, all open. This was a regular occurrence. This is probably one of the main regular occurrences on a daily, daily basis. He went around, he one thing Keith did, he documented it with military precision. Absolutely did a fantastic job taking photographs, records, documents. And that, that really helped us, really helped us a lot. Pantry door open. Now, one particular day, he lost, he went into the computer room and he's got two computers in there, one for gaming and one that he just uses for doing normal things on. And the tower was missing. He had no idea where the tower was. And it took, he, he just assumed it's it just phantomly disappeared. Three days later, he goes in the downstairs kitchen cupboard to get a pan out and finds his tower system sat on top of his pan. Could have been sat in there for three days, all he knows. But uh, quite profound, some of the things he'd reported. Things were being damaged, broken. A tremendous cost to Keith in repairing items which were broken, tipped over, a wardrobe as well. A lot of damage, a lot of expense. Scratch marks, beautiful furniture, new furniture. Taking into consideration, it was a new build and he was the second tenant to live in the house in its first construction of 10 years. This pot was purchased by Tina, an expensive, um, expensive piece of pottery that she purchased and she was very upset at finding it shattered on the floor. Now what was interesting, from its resting place, which was which was up here on top of the worktop, it would seem that it must have traversed across the room to smash on the floor because what we tended to do is we looked at the debris spread, the way it spread the debris, and we know that it must have come from a certain direction and that was not the direction of where the resting place was. So that was very interesting. Of course, Tina was quite upset. She'd spent uh, a considerable amount of money on this item. Things progressed to the point of scratch marks appearing on, on Tina's arms. She was getting quite upset. She was waking up at night, uh, sometimes feeling scratch marks in bed, feeling scratches down her arms and her legs. And photographs were taken of these welts, these scratching welts. Um, no wonder that Tina didn't stay at the location for very long, to be honest with you. Keith had come home one day from work and he had, his bedroom has two doors double doors and he found a piece of it missing just corner was just snapped off mysteriously and uh, he didn't realize where it was until he went into the tele downstairs lounge where the television is and propped up against the television screen was that piece of wood as if there it is you're not going to miss it because as soon as you come in this regularly would come in and turn the television on you're going to find it notable a very typical poltergeist type incident and of course that's the piece that was missing from the door he did have a he did try and stick that back together not brilliantly but he did manage to other things that were damaged were lights
This one was smashed. He found debris on the floor in the morning after hearing uh, something break like glass. You couldn't reach this. This is one of those lights on the landing and you've got to kind of go up the stairs to try and reach it, but you, it's very high. And as you take a step near it, you end up having to take a step down so you end up further away from it. You would have to have ladders to reach this. Um, Keith never, he left it like that because he'd had an incident where he had been claimed to have been pushed down the stairs, which led to a fractured knee, uh, knee in, his, in a bone uh, on his leg. He wasn't going to go up any ladders to fix it, so it was there like that when we arrived. You can see the pieces of glass from the light which scattered around when it broke. Another incident, exactly the same sort of thing, a light in the upstairs hallway. Now the upstairs hallway seemed to be one of the focal points in this home. And he came out of his bedroom to see this light just literally hanging there, switched on, because he leaves the lights on at night, understandably. Smashed all on the floor, all the items, and it's just hanging there, just swinging backwards and forwards. Now things started to take a bit of a turn about three months into when the phenomena started taking place. He walked into his office one day and noticed something quite unusual. He, the smell of something like smoke filled the air. And he noticed just a corner of his paper in the printer looked like it had been set on fire. It had been burned. Now Keith's not a smoker, he doesn't smoke in the house. Uh, and neither does Tina. Tina, does, Tina didn't smoke. And he was, he was quite baffled, so he took a photo off of it. But this was one of the first things in regarding incendiary conditions, spontaneous fires just bursting out or bursting into flame. Another incident was he, for a few days he started to smell smoke downstairs in the kitchen. He couldn't find anything. It was annoying him. He was walking around, sniffing the air. He could smell something burning. And this went on for a few days, but could never locate anything. Eventually, it caught his eye. The crucifix that it had up on the wall seemed to start singeing the wall, as you can just see here and here. It's, the crucifix seemed to be burning the wall, yet it was made from wood. It hadn't combusted, yet it was very profound, because once we actually moved it off the wall, we could see almost the shape of the crucifix. Other things which combusted was this, um, he's, he was a gamer, fantasy flights he loved, um, and this, this was one of the, uh, one of the posters that they uh, produced, but he actually bought that, and it's, uh, it was made of a plastic material. Now at this point he was at work, and he got a phone call from the fire service, which were at, at his home. There'd been a report, the fire alarms had gone off, they, they'd come out, looked at it, put, put it out, it was literally dripping around because there was plastic involved, but they couldn't work out how it caught fire. There was no explanation. Now we were lucky enough to, to confirm the fire regulations report, the officer's report, that they had no, ex no idea how it combusted, how it caught fire in a location where nobody was at home and only alerted by the, uh, the fire alarm, which is part of the, uh, the, the burglar system. But it's not the only thing uh, that seemed to catch fire. Keith reported on occasion that whilst he was wearing shirt and tie, he worked as an IT guy. In the morning he was downstairs having breakfast and suddenly he felt some singeing pain, threw the shirt off his back to find burn marks in it, like little holes. And uh, he, this happened on two occasions. And what was funny is that he told me a story that one morning he went upstairs to get changed for work. He came down, shirt and tie as he normally does, and went outside, shut the door behind him, locked the door. As he was walking down the drive, he thought, it's a, bit, it's a bit drafty. And as he looked down, he noticed that the buttons on his shirt weren't there anymore. The buttons off the shirt had disappeared. Now, it sounds quite profound. I have no evidence to suggest that. Uh, I wasn't there at the time. But uh, some of the information we are going to provide today is from when we were there, and that's what really counts. Again, more evidence of uh, burn marks on the shirt. And it wasn't just shirts, Bibles were left out. Keith was hoping that to try and ward off any bad spirits, to leave the house uh, alone, leave him alone. 
and of course that apparently didn't work, caused some upset, fires were spontaneously taking place on these Bibles. Now Keith had about three of these around the house. What was really interesting, you, you can see, completely see on this one, it's completely obliterated, absolutely obliterated, there's nothing left of this. But it wasn't just that one Bible, it was this particular Bible as well, it was left on a shelf on the hallway upstairs. Now, we investigated this, and what was really interesting is, is that where the Bible sat, as it is, notice that there isn't really much ash around. But there must have been a considerable fire there for that to happen. No charring on the wall, no burn marks on the wall, and most interestingly, about a foot and a half above that shelf was another shelf, and there was no heat marks, no charring underneath the upper shelf, with no explanation for it. The only thing we can consider is that maybe heat was applied to the pages, but not a living flame, in a sense of speaking. Now, it's, it's certainly not something that we would normally do, is set fire to a Bible. It's not really the thing I'd like to do, but sometimes you've got to do some things in the name of science. So unfortunately, and I'll say sorry for it, that we ended up having to rip a few pages out of the Bible just to see what the conditions would be under heat or living flame. Now, when you apply a match to these pages, it's like a cigarette paper, and boy, do they go up. Woof! You know, and now I don't know if they do that on purpose or not, but uh, it could be the quality of the paper, the thinness of it, the ink that's inside it, but they go up like a, like a rocket with a living flame. Um, but these whole pages are completely, it, it actually traces, like, like lighting a cigarette paper, it just carries on and on and on and on, so that page is literally gone. In, well, it's interesting in this particular Bible that it was seen to be all singed around the edges, like heat had been applied to it, more so than a living flame. We've no explanation as to how these fires occurred, but uh, it was certainly interesting that we couldn't replicate the exact conditions of the effects on these Bibles with a, with a match, for an example. Another Bible was found one day as he came home from work, literally ripped up and scattered around the house. Oh, pages all over the place. Um, Keith was rather upset about that. I remember him uh, contacting me to say about that particular incident. And he put out another Bible. Now, these Bibles were practice Bibles. These weren't ones that you just go and buy in a shop. They came from places where they were used in churches or somebody used them for practice. They believed that that might have a little, warrant a little bit more um, power, should you say, to help assist getting rid of something untoward. One particular Bible disappeared completely. He'd lost it for three months or so, never to be seen again, until he decided to put his washing in the washing, uh, the washing machine one day. He popped it in the washer, he turned it on, he walked away, and as he was walking away, he heard this thumping sound, boom, 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 boom. And he rushed back to the washer thinking what that noise was, stopped it, drained it, opened it, and in there was the Bible that had disappeared three months earlier. And as you can see, it's, uh, it was very wet at the time, and he had no, he had no idea how he got in there. He, he claimed there was certainly nothing in there when he was putting in the washing in the first place. It just seemed to manifest. A number of photographs that Keith had were also adversely affected, as if heat had been applied to them. Not a living flame, but heat. Now what was interesting about these particular photographs was the only part of the photographs with him on it were damaged. Keith's face. These are photographs of him and his family. But Keith's face has been obliterated by, by burning. And again. And again. And this went on for some time. Now, Keith also said there's lots of strange things going on with the lighting and electrical system. Again, something that often is reported in poltergeist infestations. He looked into this quite intensively. He checked over the internet as well. And so he was learning about the phenomena as he went on, about what things have been reported in the past. He was determined to try and find out what it was. He believed it was some type of poltergeist infestation. We did. We certainly, the, it was certainly the attributes were there. He wrote these things down, weird phenomena, light loss. There had been on a few occasions where the whole house had just lost light completely. Sometimes it had dimmed very low, 
come back up. Sometimes it'd go off. On one occasion, he contacted the electrical board, and they said, well, you know, they'd run a check, because apparently they can do things a little bit differently over there, and they confirmed there was nothing wrong. Everything was fine with the circuit breakers. Some 20 minutes later, they, it came back on, which was really uh, unusual. Now, these sort of things were happening all the time, and I asked him, well, you know, what sorts, what's the most common? He said, well, the lights flicker. It drives me mad, the lights flick. And occasionally, even the light switches go up and down at high speed. I said, well, can you try and record some of this for us? Um, this particular video was taken from his office. And he was leaving cameras around the house, video recording. And Keith was downstairs watching television at the time. And what's actually happening here, through analysis, and it is difficult because you get pixelation when you, when you zoom in, but through analysis, the actual light switch is, or does seem to be moving. You can see here from the analysis. And this was happening regularly. This was happening not just in one room, but numerous different rooms. Sometimes the light switch wasn't flicking on and off, but the light was going on and off very fast, extremely fast. Sometimes the light switches would be moved up and down. Other things that was happening were plants. He had a number of, of uh, plants in the house. Occasionally, he'd come home and find some tipped over. This one, though, was the most profound one, was the plant had disappeared. It had clearly been tipped over, thrown on the floor, but the plant was missing. He couldn't find it. He didn't know where it had gone. Other plants were often found on the floor, broken, torn apart, tipped over. In fact, this large plant was seen by four witnesses to literally levitate and throw herself across the room on one occasion. That was during the housewarming party where he had four friends over who also reported what they'd seen. Scratch marks appeared on walls for no explanation, no reasons why, how they got there, but uh, they were quite, it, it was a new build. The walls were beautifully uh, plastered, the carpets were, were new. It, it was a lovely place, but these sort of things stuck out very much so. Strange marks on the floor appeared, just black marks that they didn't know, little specks of black marks, no explanation where they come from. Just one minute, everything was fine, the following day, there they were. These are some of the holes or indentations from objects that suddenly just fly across the room and uh, almost bury themselves into the plastered walls hence him calling out contractors to fill up these. Now Keith sent this to me and he even done a drawing because he thought it was that interesting. He, he was, it was early morning when he was going to go to work and around 6.30 a.m. he was walking, he'd locked up the, uh, the house, he was walking to the car but he got that feeling that he was being watched and he quickly turned around to see something as if somebody was in the house peeking through the blinds and as soon as he looked up and saw this, it, was, it shut tight quickly, as if something was spying on him. Um, he was quite upset about that. That was his office, the room in the house that was regularly getting trashed. This is another incident when Keith said that he, the first apparition he believes was seen. As he was sat at a table in the kitchen, something caught his eye peeking around the staircase. And he, I asked him to draw a picture of it, take a photo of the location. And this is what he did. Now, we tried to replicate and see what sort of angle that was when we were there, for that someone to actually poke the face around the corner with the hands. And we couldn't do so, because because of this, this, the way the stairs are, we'd be further down. It would indicate that if something was seen like that, at that height, with its hands around the corner watching him, that it must have been on the wall and not the floor, which is quite disturbing. For Keith, he absolutely freaked out that night. He left the house that night, um, and I believe he went to friends. But uh, he was really upset about seeing something like that. He described it as um, rather dark-skinned, a girl with, as he explained, crazy hair, all stuck up. But she was just there watching him. But when Keith panicked, it would seem that she scurried away and seemed to go upstairs and across the land. He could hear like running footsteps. So we took all this in, the, in account when we, when we went there. This is an x-ray from when the damage to his bone on his leg and his kneecap 
when he said he was pushed down the stairs as one of the x-rays he was laid up in bed for a while because of that now this is where it starts really getting profound strange markings started to appear now this is the point where at first I thought I'm not having this I'm not swallowing this it's too much to believe you know I mean I've been in the field a long time in paranormal research and I've never come across something like this before so I didn't take lightly to it at first he thought these markings on his uh, on his computer table was hair hair strands but it wasn't because when he rang his fingers over it it was actually markings on the wood and it, it he thought, well, what is it? Is it ink? It's not ink. He didn't know what it was. He wasn't there the night before. It weren't burn marks. It wasn't ink. It wasn't hair. But you just couldn't work out. You couldn't feel anything on the surface of the wood. And yet, there it was. But that wasn't the end of it. Things started really taking a turn. Now, you'll understand by these next images why I wasn't going to swallow it. Now, the last time we ever see anything like that is usually in an omen film. You know, We just don't see it. You know, I've never seen this in any form of what I consider an authentic paranormal case. 666 drawn on a wall, I mean, come on, really, seriously. But there's a little bit more to it. We, and I started to look into these markings quite seriously and analysing them. And we also talked to a number of experts. Another 666 that appeared on the wall. Now, when you start to look at these very closely, this is what was really interesting, is the application process. Take in consideration that some of these markings were on his ceiling. and There was no dripping to the ground. So it wasn't applied in, with something that causes dripping. It wasn't applied with a brush. We talked to our experts, we talked to an artist, and he said it's a work of art. When he looked at it properly, up close, he said it's a work of art. We talked to other people in the, in the painting and industry. And they said, well, we don't know what the application was. It's quite profound. And I'll explain the reasons why. The markings consist of millions of little lines and little dots that make up. And as you can see, millions of little lines and little dots. Now, you can't feel anything on the wall. There's no, mark, no surface feeling to it. It's as if like it's maybe just come out of the wall, in the sense of speaking. But we couldn't work out its application. But not just that, but there seemed to be some type of undulating pattern to these. And as you start to look more seriously at the millions and millions of dots and little lines that make up the images, you start to see undulating patterns within them. Like a backbone. These undulating patterns, again, on the ceiling. Now, what's interesting is that this particular marking on the ceiling here, we looked at it and said, yeah, it kind of looks like a, a stick man figure. Didn't know really anything about it at the time. We had to look into it. But it was on the ceiling as well. No, again, no dripping, no, no signs of dripping, anything on the floor. The nearest thing we found to this is something what we call horsehair pottery. And it was created by... <coughs> Excuse me, created by the Native American Indians. And they used hair. They heated up to a ridiculous temperature. And when they dropped it across certain pottery, it would blend in with the pottery and make these, what we refer to as horse hair pottery, made up of little lines and little dots. And it was, that's the nearest thing we could find to it. Notice the analysis here. You can see the undulating patterns. It wasn't as simple as just a mark on the wall. Yeah, when you first look at it, it's just a mark. But when you start scrutinizing it and looking at it and analyzing it, there's a little, little something strange about this. And as you can see, the patterns here, 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 here. And it goes on to talk about the horsehair pottery. Now, this particular figure, which we mentioned a little bit earlier, on the ceiling, I said I didn't know. I, at the time, I had, I had no idea what it was, what it represented. But through research, when we put this figure in on Google it, Google it yourselves, um, it's a Native American symbol that represents mankind. However, taking into consideration this is found on the ceiling, if you invert this figure and turn it upside down, it means the death of a man or dying of a man. 
And that could have been a reference point because when we're looking up at the ceiling, we couldn't tell if it was upside down or not. You don't know what perspective it is. Talked with Keith in depth about a lot of the things that took place there. We, we said to Keith, bottom line is, if we come out to Seattle, and yes, it's expensive, it's going to cost us money, it's going to cost us time, expense, and a lot of effort, but if we come out there and we find any hoaxing, anything dodgy, Keith, we'll basically, we'll crucify you. you know? we, we'll, we'll put it out there across the internet, everywhere, we'll discredit you. You know, so what, are you sure you really want our involvement? And in, he said, yeah, you're the, you're the guys I need. And, and you know, I, these things are happening. I need someone to take me seriously. After all, Ghost Adventures have been in and said, no evidence, nothing exists, and kind of pointed the finger at them. Of course, he wanted some vindication. He was upset that Tina had left him over all this problem. He was upset that phenomenon was still going on. He was upset that people didn't believe him. So I said, okay, fine. We'll call his bluff. We went out there. And I went with a colleague. And uh, when we got there, the first thing to do was obviously just interview and interview and interview. Got all the details down on. Keith was explaining to me that uh, this particular, these particular cameras, which work by Wi-Fi, they send signals out to um, the, his laptop, which pings when, they take, when it takes a photo. And it takes a photo because of the motion detection. And he's got them pointing towards the front door. The front door is over this way. And he's got two of them here. On occasion, he said, these cameras would move. He's had to purchase other cameras because he'd come downstairs one morning and that camera would be facing the wall. And he'd turn it back round. And the second day he'd come down, the camera was facing the wall. He turned it again. On the third day he came down, the camera was facing the wall. I get a bit fed up with this. So he, he scoured a little bit, turned the camera back. The following day, he came down straight away to look where that camera was, and it wasn't even there. The camera was gone. He never found the camera again. He never, re he never responded to his email. He never pinged again. It just phantomly disappeared, never to return. So he ended up going out and buying more cameras. So that was a, a common thing that was happening. He'd lost four or five cameras over a period of four years. And what was interesting is that he's explaining to me about these cameras and the actual occurrence did actually take place whilst we were there, which we did not expect. Um, we conducted a lot of research whilst we were there, uh, environmentals, geomagnetic, electromagnetic, microwave, magnetic air, all sorts of different things. You know, we wanted to know if there was anything it could attribute to such reported disturbances. Could it be that uh, hallucinations were involved? You know, is he of sound mind? Because at the end of the day, Keith might believe this is real. He could be delusional. You know, is he of a sound mind? There's a lot of things to take into consideration. And, you know, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence at the end of the day. That's myself examining the holes. You can see that he'd even attempted to cover up some of the holes himself. But some of these objects traveled so fast across the location that they'd hit the wall quite hard and literally bury themselves in the wall. That's Keith's attempt, wonderful attempt at fixing the door. I wouldn't have him do any DIY stuff for me, of course. But nevertheless, though, he's, uh, that's his attempt, and you can see me having a good look at it there. Now, the research carried out. There has been considerable research, and still research is going on, because it takes such a long time to obtain information from Bothell, Seattle's record office, because us us guys are UK guys, and maybe they just drag their feet a little. I just really don't know. But uh, we are, are obtaining some information over a long period of time. Some of the um, statistical analysis carried out. We were looking for things what might be triggers. After all, Keith had provided us a, literally a report day by day over a four-year period of what had been going on. And you can see here, 2013, you know, 2015, and and so on, and it, 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 we looked at the times when activity was taking place and the peak values, and we're seeing, having a look to see if it falls in any certain pattern. Now, what was interesting is that the peak of activities here and here seemed to fall in with the spring rise, the spring equinox, and the summer rise or the summer solstice. Could be just a coincidence. Maybe, but maybe there might be something to it. We don't know. But it's interesting to conduct these type of surveys. We also looked into lunar cycles. 
um, and to find out if there was any correlations regarding new moon and, and so on and so forth. But no, there wasn't, because they just fall into random events of new moon, waxing crescents, waning crescents, and there was nothing significant, no pattern regarding lunar activity and phenomena taking place. What did seem to be spikes of, in, spikes of phenomena taking place at the spring equinox and the summer rise, the summer solstice. We also had geological research, and geopathic stress analysis of the land to see if there was any natural causes for maybe some of the strange things that might have been taking place in his home. But by all accounts from the research carried out, it seemed to be just normal. Nothing unusual. No different than really my, our homes, I assume. The location, these, uh, as you can see, these uh, new houses, estates, now, they're only 10 years old. So we were trying to figure out what was there prior to the build. Now, this is Keith's house here, if you can see from Google. And there is, at the back of Keith's, uh, a brook, or what they might recall to uh, a small stream. Uh, and that's been there literally forever. It's, it was part of the land, it just never disturbed it, they kept it there as a natural water source. And it's just at the back of the, the rear of Keith's house here. As you can see. Now, what's interesting is, through research, we looked at all 70 odd houses on this estate, and there was only one only one house that had a pre-existing dwelling and that was this wooden log cabin and that was exactly where Keith's house was built. Keith's house was the only house to have a pre-existing building on it prior to its build. Um, we talked with the construction guys. Now there seemed to be some elements here that we were kind of thinking okay is it simply going to be one of those things that you hear and see in movies you know, it's built over Indian burial grounds, you know, uh, Native American, and then of course they're haunting the house. You know, it, sounds, it just sounds more something more and more like something you'd read in a horror novel or, or, or one of those very uh, dodgy movies that we probably see on the paranormal. You just, you don't often come across things like that. Um, so we, did, we had to look into it though. So what's the possibilities of it? Well, what was really interesting is that we went to see uh, Father Roy. Now, Father Roy had been called out to the house several times and conducted what we refer to as a blessing. And I was quite taken back when I met Father Roy, lovely guy, really nice guy. And he said to me, I believe there's enough evidence to support that the house may, may have been uh, constructed over Native American burial grounds. I thought, really? <laughs> Could it be that simple? So we decided to find some research out about the location, the area, and lo and behold, the whole area was riveted around with, with stories of skirmishes and battles and even wars against the Native American Indians that were living in Bothell many years ago. And they employed people to, to log, take down their trees in the forests where they lived. And of course, these battles and skirmishes and wars took place, and there were many deaths. But scattered around were burial sites. Now, the Native Americans at that location had several burial sites. It wasn't just one. You'd have literally one per household, in a sense of speaking. And uh, they'd scatter these small ones all over the place. So they were quite happy to live amongst uh, these burial sites, and, uh, and they did so. But when the construction company came along, and it's a little bit different in the US. I mean, we'd expect all hell to break loose over here in the UK. But over there, they're digging away. And all of a sudden, they come across some bones. Hang on, guys, hang on. Tools down, tools down. Make a phone call. About an hour and a half later, a guy comes out and goes, well, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, looks Native American to me. OK, you're OK, guys. You can, you can move it. They move it. Literally two or three days later, they're back in construction. That's what it's like. You know, they just... It's just the way things are over there. It's kind of quite normal. It's quite shocking to happen over here, wouldn't it? <laughs> but uh, it was surprising. So I thanked him for the information. I thought, do you know, can it really be that simple? Is there, it could the house be literally constructed over an Indian burial site? And if so, did they relocate the bodies? Um, we visited the locations of graveyards and stuff, and most of them, you did see Americans, uh, Native American Indian burial grounds as well. What was interesting is we found out some information to say, yes, the gravestones are there, but the bodies aren't. Well, where are the bodies? Well, 
we couldn't really find out where the bodies went. Maybe they just went to a mass, a mass dig. I just, we just really don't know. We don't know what was involved, when it happened, the expense of it, how the Americans think about things like that at the time. But nevertheless, though, there were certainly areas of Native American burial grounds with headstones with no bodies in there. Now, for anybody who goes to America, and some of us may have been there, um, if you're carrying a lot of equipment with you, it's not for the faint-hearted. And um, I remember getting to the airport with all this equipment, and a guy took us into the room, and the first thing he did is he, he went like this and put his hand on his gun. And he opened the case and he said, what's this? And what's that? And he pulled out my, um, one of the um, microphones the, with a gun microphone. <laughs> it looked like a gun, actually. It wasn't, that one didn't go down too well. But trying to explain to the guys and trying to get all this equipment into the US was, a, was literally a logistic nightmare. But we did so. But we only took four rigs with us out of 21 because literally the logistics of it was, uh, was, was very hard. So we had to be very careful about what equipment we do take in. But what was interesting is that we had equipment that would monitor the, the environmentals, the sounds, anything in that house on a 24-hour basis. The, the, the range of equipment that we were using was very large. The methods of audio recording was uh, intense. We had items like the very, very sensitive parabolics, which literally pick a pin drop up at 30, at 30 feet, literally can pick up a pin drop. These things were left running all the time. Uh, and, and we were glad, to, uh, we're glad we did that as well. Obviously taking notes, we're having to do so. Um, and, and lots of different types of things because, you know, it's, there's always been that argument. Does it subdue phenomena taking in equipment? Some cases, yeah. But how else are you supposed to record evidence? You've got to use it. There's no, it's a catch-22 situation. So we wouldn't we weren't know what we were expecting when we got there. And you can see all the different types of cameras that we use. We used a range of different things because we were shooting at the end of the day. We were also shooting an episode for Phenomena Project. And this was going to be, which we didn't know at the time, but this is going to be the flagship because of what went on. The flagship that will launch the series. And of course, things were just left running every night around the clock for the duration whilst we were there. And you can see from key stock documents and logs, precision about events that took place. They were regular, they were daily almost. Even emails previous communications, which are interesting, because it's not, it doesn't show that the story's just been fabricated for us. It's been a history of this phenomenon going on. And at this one, he's saying, hello, Laura, Tina's out at town in Vegas. I bought some sage yesterday on the way home and spread it around. And last night, I lit sage, my front door slammed open, and my ADT security monitor went off saying, front door open, it does. When you open the front door, it says front door open. Now, it's very intriguing that the first day we got there, of course, we'd unpacked, we'd introduced ourselves to Keith, very nice guy, we had a cup of coffee. Seattle coffee. Seattle coffee, very, very nice. And um, we needed a few things. We needed some amenities, some drinks and bits of food and things. So Keith took us to the local shop. He locked up, we went down to the shop, 20 minutes, it must have took 20 minutes in total. We came back, the front door's wide open. The alarm's not going. The alarm's obviously set. The alarm's not going, it's not showing the front door open, yet it's wide open. More interesting, the lock is still, is still in the lock position. How the door opened and kept its lock position, we don't know. I looked over across at my colleague, Don, and I kind of sniggered and said, somebody else has got a key, got to have, you know, it's a joke, someone's pulling our leg. This is the first day we were there. You know, it's not, things like this aren't, don't really happen very often. Um, but we never did find an explanation for it. And it wasn't the first time or the last time that happened. Uh, other recorded information uh, in a way of transcripts in communications that have took place. I mean, this one was from 2012. So, you know, there's been, you can see that there's been documented stuff going on for four years. So it's not like it's just, we've just come along and things have been going on for some time. Now, whilst we were there, Fox, Fox News contacted us and said, hey, can we send some guys out? You know, we want to cover this, and fine, if you want to come out, as long as you don't interfere too much with our investigation. They came out, they interviewed us, and what was interesting is that some of the recordings that we were capturing, audible recordings, were second to none. 
I mean, I've been in this subject 34 years, and I've listened and heard what I refer to as EVP, electronic voice phenomena. But this is much more than that. This was, in a sense, like communication. The voices were ridiculous, like somebody was actually there. On many occasions, there was questions asked and answered even obtained. That is an EVP. That's heading towards your ITC, your instrumental transcommunication. This is heading towards what we refer to as AVP, actual voice phenomena. Of course, we talk, photographers turned up from newspapers. We had to conduct our investigation around all this mess, literally. It's very, very difficult. And we don't normally take cases like this because it gets too heavily involved with the media. It's difficult. It muddies the waters. But we were there to try and help Keith. We believed he was being sincere and it was just trying to reach out for help. So, how did the night progress? Well, one of the first incidents was, I was the last one to go to bed, it was early hours, I think it was almost 10, I think it was 10 to 5 in the morning. We got, I, I came back after seven, six or seven days at, at Seattle on the first visit with um, sleep deprivation. In fact, it was, I was suffering from something called, uh, it's like being drunk, sleep drunkness <laughs> in the sense of speaking. Um, I, I was slurring my words, I was feeling dizzy, I, I, was, I had to go to sleep for literally two, almost a full two days just to try and recoup. And the reason being is because the phenomenon that was taking place at this home was so regular that I didn't want to miss it. I didn't want to miss the opportunity to capture something of this magnitude. I've never seen this type of stuff before. I mean, I've been in the field 34 years, and 32 of that, I've never seen... Uh, yeah, there's been some things, but nothing to this magnitude, and I was quite surprised, taken back. So, yeah, I wasn't getting much sleep, an hour, probably a day. Um, so it really did, uh, it did weigh on you. But I was the last person that went to bed. Now I've got Keith and my colleague Don. And Keith's bedroom's here, and this this alcove here, there's another door to the, another bedroom. As I walked upstairs, the house rattled with snoring coming from both rooms, which does happen. I'm sure there's some snorers here, but they'd never admit it. And this, I make a mental note where the door positions are, you know, just to, it's just a habit I do. It's just, I'm always switched on. I'm looking the positions of the doors, which one's open, which ones are closed, and I go to bed. But literally 45 minutes later, there's the sound of a door as if you pulled it shut, not turn the handle, but a definite loud click, as if a door had been shut. Rushing to the landing, I can still hear them pair snoring their heads off, and I'm thinking, what made the sound? I'm looking at all the doors, and none of what, not a single one had moved. They were all in exactly the same position as I saw them as I went to bed. But nevertheless, though, the sound which was also recorded as well on our recording devices, which was very loud, was the sound of a door clicking shut. So we do believe that it could be doing a paranormal action. They have sometimes the capabilities of recording events and playing them back randomly. And they tend to be common events. Doors closing, kettles boiling, people calling your name, toilets flushing, taps turning on. It tends to be those sort of things, regular incidents being recorded and played back randomly. The problem is, is that when you hear them, you can't discern which is a real event and which is a recording of that event. Nevertheless, though, we got it. Don't forget, parabolic microphones are here, a pin drop at 30 feet. These are running all night. We recorded all the events, so we got the times, the frequencies, the lengths, when it happened. CCTV cameras were in operation, but they were faulting regularly. And they were also taking photographs of nothing. For some reason, motion detection was set off when we're, in, when we're in bed. And a series of 30, 40 photographs are taken for no apparent reason. Now, when we talked about this camera, it happened whilst we were there. Myself, Keith, and Don, a colleague of mine, were, all, we were the only three people in the house, all in the kitchen area, sat at the table talking. When Keith's laptop went ping, he said, oh, I said, what's that? He said, it's one of the cameras he sent me some information. There's been, one's been triggered. And it was like this camera, as we saw earlier, this camera in the lounge that had sent that information. It had sent a photograph of just a grey wall. It would seem that is 
took a photograph of a wall, but it wasn't pointing towards the wall. When we went into the lounge, it was in fact pointing the wall. It had turned 180 degrees. Now, taking in consideration that these particular cameras and the spec on them takes a photograph around about 12 milliseconds, it should have taken a photograph in transition of movement from 180 degrees, but it didn't. It would seem it took a photograph as soon as it had moved 180 degrees. Photograph of the wall, it was facing the wall. Now, what was interesting, it should have took a photograph maybe through its transition, but it never did. So I have to question sometimes, do these objects really move from point A to point B, or did it just materialize instantly? And hence, that's why we only got a photograph of the wall. It's very, very mysterious, but most of all, the most significant thing is it actually happened whilst we were there. Nobody was there. The incident happened in a location where no human agencies were. That had to be, that deserves explanation, the scientific explanation. And we don't, we can't provide one. And that's what makes it something under the heading of possibly paranormal. There were also infrared unusual things that took place there, the infrared area, uh, a hot spot you could call, no apparent reason for it. It vanished, it never came back again under the same conditions, the same time, same location, same heating in the house. In fact, we turned off heating when we were doing such tests on thermal because we don't want thermal tracing to appear. But there were anomalies. This basketball-sized object just seemed to hang around for a short period of time and bang, disappeared, never to return. We see monitoring regularly, 24 hours around the clock. Uh, thermal imaging was also used uh, to see if there were differences in darkened areas or UV flooded areas. Uh, laser nets were used. We use all lots of different types of equipment to try and figure out what's going on. Uh, laser trip wires. Now, we'd set up this laser trip wire. And as you can see, this is one being set up. Okay. Now, they're fascinating because if you cross the beam, they just simply alert you. Now, throughout the night, throughout the investigation, three days in, we'd been using infrared. Most people tend to use infrared in investigations, but we weren't really getting a lot. And we thought, okay, let's change the method. Because, only because of one recording that we got. We got a recording, and by all intents and purposes, it said when we were doing infrared testing, it bothers us. It bothers us. We didn't know, we were trying to figure out what does that mean, what it bothers us. And we just sort of sat there at the table rummaging around trying to think what that might re mean when a little light bulb went on and thought, okay, are they referring to the infrared we're using? And Don looked at me, I looked over Don, and shrugged our shoulders and, okay, let's change the method of investigation. Let's drop the infrared, let's go with optical laser. And we did. And I'd literally set this up on the landing. L literally, walked away, set it up, walked away. Now, there was two of them further down the corridor and I got to the bottom of the stairs, and what happened was it went straight into alert mode. Beep, 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 all going off. What was interesting is I immediately stopped, looked at Don, I turned around, this is all in within seconds, and I ran up the stairs. And as I ran up those stairs, I heard something, something running away. It sounded like small feet, sounded like child, like a child. And what was really interesting is that it set off the second detector further down the hall, as if it made its escape. And I'm hot behind it. I'm running after this thing. I can't see anything, but I'm running after it. And I'm running down the hall. It's set the next one off. It's headed it off before me into the back bedroom. Nothing there. No idea what it was. But we heard the front small footsteps. It was like we were pursuing something like a child. But isn't it interesting that it went off immediately? Maybe it was just something that was checking out what it was, what the equipment it was. Maybe it was just something that panicked and ran, away, ran off and was, of course, being alerted and being captured on these devices. Now, the all double phenomena, when I said it's second to none, these things, whatever they were recordings were, were intelligent, were vocals, and were definitely seemed to be, have an interest in what we were doing, and they were also trying to identify the equipment what we were using. So we decided to use some specialized listening devices and recording devices. We used something called a task cam because they wouldn't maybe not be able to identify what that was. We just tried different methods of capturing because we're assuming at this point they are intelligent and know what we're doing. And this is when we were setting up the task cam. Now myself and Don uh, are walking up the stairs 
And we get a bit into a conversation at the top of the stairs about is there a, a micro recording card in the Tascam? Yes, it's, he says, no, it isn't. Oh, yes, yes, it is. And just as he places the Tascam back down on the landing, um, on, the, uh, on the landing shelf, you hear, it's a camera, it's a camera. Now, it's not my voice. And it's not Don's voice. And we're the only two up there. And what's really interesting, we didn't hear anything. In fact, we didn't even know we got this until we came back looking through the, the video footage for the television episode that we've got these on there. Now, I'll play the footage, and what I'll do is I'll, um, I'll point on a screen like this when it comes in, so it identifies where it is. It's a camera. It's a camera. Let's listen to it. Okay, so let's go out five minutes, and okay. what we'll do is we'll put this yeah. recording unit in one of the rooms and just leave it. I see one of the rooms. Actually, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put it here. Yeah. Because this will capture then sound from here, sound from there, sound from there, and also even sound from down there. Okay, so I'll just power this up. Now that's the task cam which we use. See how sensitive our equipment is. Don just sneezed and he set one off. Now at this point, Don's asking, is there a, a memory card in the device? Where is it? I thought I put it in there, hold on. Wait, it is in here. Sorry, it is in here. I'll do this again. I'll do this again. Did you hear it? It's a camera. It's a camera. It's very, very clear. Well, the one, we heard a voice. It said, I love her. Just come out the blue. I love her. It sounded like a female voice. Again, caught on the recordings. And then the next bit, which is quite quirky, actually, because Don had asked me to do this shoot three times. And now for the third time, I had to, all I had to do was go to the front door, open the door, and walk in. And he said, no, do it again, let's do it again. And, and it just ended up the third time. But the first response was seen to be a female voice. There were no females there. Only myself and Don at that time. I love her. And the second one, it said, on three. It was interesting. Let me play, this. Let me play the clip. Straight from that, come down. We're going straight out. Yeah, see, I love her. Oh, Steve, we need to go out together. And there's an on three in the background. Now, when we play these and analyse them, we're getting these type of vocals across the cameras, and we don't know where they're coming from. It's interesting to know that they didn't get it on the microphones. The microphones that were set up, the parabolics that pick a pin drop up at 30 feet, didn't get them, and they should have done. But how did it get on the cameras? How did it, the Audible get on the cameras? My name is Barry Fitzgerald and I'm a long-time researcher of the supernatural and a world traveller. Don Phillips and Stephen Mira forwarded me some samples of EVPs they captured on one of their cases and asked for my analysis. I found it interesting when breaking the samples into various frequency ranges that the male voice, which can be clearly heard in the EVP, actually appear stronger in the higher ranges and away above the ranges of the normal human male or female voice. Now that was Barry Fitzgerald. For anybody who knows Barry, he's from the TV show International, Ghost, Hunt, Ghost Hunters International. Uh, Barry's a good friend of ours and he's been working with us in the project to assist us regarding analysis of some of these recordings. And as he clearly said there, that the recordings sound human, but don't respond in frequencies like human voices are. They're well above human vocals. In other words, they're above 255 hertz. That's a top range. Females have a slightly higher vocal range than male, but the highest pitch range is around about 255 hertz. These are a lot higher than that. Yet hearing them, they sound no different than a human vocal, but analyzing something significantly different takes place. So, when we go into any building, the first thing we do is 
we do a 10 second or five second little video shoot. And I did this on a mobile phone. Now it's a Samsung S7, so you pretty much have a good idea how good those cameras are. They're exceptional cameras on these phones now. And we use it 10 seconds in each room, video, and then I take a photograph. 10 seconds in that room, a video, then I take a photograph. And it's just a habit I've done because sometimes you get little discrepancies between the photos and videos. You just never know what you're going to get. Um, and I'd totally forgotten about this. In fact, we'd analysed all the video footage for Phenomena Project and it was only when I was sat at the kitchen table one day looking through my video photos. Oh, hang on a second. I've got like 15 videos and 15 photographs here of Keith's house. Now, what was interesting is that I remember taking this piece of video and... It was, so I was stood on the top of the staircase and just 10 seconds just looking down it and then taking a photograph. I remember where Don was. Don was in the kitchen with Keith. There was nobody else there and there was nobody in the lounge area, the front lounge area of the room. There was nobody there, only me on the landing. So this area was free. But if you look at the video again, you can clearly see a light source because of the shadowing of the table. Because there is, there's a light source over here in the corner. But the photograph shows something a little bit different. The video, the photo. The video, the photo. Only a second apart from each other. But we're looking at this, what is this? Now, taking in the angles here, we're looking at the angles of lighting it doesn't fall characteristically the angles of light. There's only one light source coming from the lounge area, and that is up in the corner here. So we cast at this angle. But this here seems to have a different angle of perception altogether. As to what that is, I don't know. I have no explanation for the photograph. I don't like to say, yes, it's a shadow person, it's an apparition, it's an anomaly. It looks human size. It doesn't fall into the normal characteristics of the shadow behavior because I'm stood here and I've took a photograph and a video. The light source is over here in the corner. So all the angles are, are considerably right to the lights, except that shadowy figure on the wall. No idea. But it's interesting. And of course, I had to put it into the report because I've no explanation for it. A shadow where nobody is. It's not my shadow. SAP had to go back again, a second visit. And um, the reason why is because, because of the things we were experiencing there, we needed uh, an independent observation. We needed an independent observation. We needed another expert there. You know, not so that you don't have to take my word for it, but somebody who's credible, notable, somebody who's believable, honorable, you know, somebody who's dedicated to the work, and, and is completely truthful about it. Somebody will call it as it is, say it is. And no, we couldn't think of any person better than a gentleman called Nick Kyle, who is the president of the Scottish Society of Psych Psychical Research. And uh, he came to Seattle with us. And um, Fox News came out and actually had a chat with Nick. Yep. Okay, Kyle, how do you spell your last name, Nick? K-Y-L-E. Okay, and how would you like me to refer to you, your proper title? Uh, well, I'm president of the Scottish Society for Psychical Research, but that's about my mouthful, so... Yeah. <laughs> um, maybe uh, uh, a paranormal uh, investigator from Scotland would do. Okay. Psychical and, and researcher. And just so I'm clear on your relationship with these guys, you are an independent. You you're, you're know them, but not connected with them. I've never worked with them before. I know of them, and uh, I was interested in their case. Uh, when, uh, when they said they were coming back for a second visit, I said that I felt their case, if they came across phenomena, would be strengthened if they could have someone independent who could scrutinise their work and be available as a point of reference. You know, if they, if they say that they did a particular methodology, I'm there to say that's correct, they did. And if they got a particular result at the end of that, then, yeah, I was there and that's what happened. And, and from what you've seen, what is your, uh, your, what is your impression or your uh, interpretation? My impression is that um, the SSPR has been investigating cases for uh, 29 years in Scotland and that this is a fairly typical case in recent days. Um, and I would say that uh, Steve is meticulous in his approach 
Don is uh, a, a curiosity because what's happening with him would appear to be paranormal and I, I still can't figure out how he can do what he can do. But I'm here not so much to pass judgment as to be an independent witness, but rather than someone off the street um, or someone with obvious integrity, um, I do have a background in investigating cases. And I, uh, the, the SSPR in Scotland is a conservative, highly ethical uh, body. Um, we are very careful in what we do, and I think that's probably what the guys wanted. Someone who's cautious, careful, conservative, and will not seek to curry favour. So as much as I like these guys, haven't met them, I won't say anything that I am not sure about. Let me back up. So Don is a curiosity. D does Don attract uh, paranormal activity? Does he, does he draw it out, do you think? He seems to. And, why, why, and is that unusual? No, there are lots of uh, people who can walk into situations and, and get uh, phenomena happening around about them. Uh, the, the term we would use in the UK would be mediums. Um, not quite sure if that's the word I would use for Don. Uh, I think maybe uh, some kind of specialist or facilitator of EVP. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and there are other people who can walk into haunted situations and the phenomena collapses. It just stops. And they're, not, they're cooler. Yeah, and, yeah. I, and I'm not sure why that is, but I think there is a difference um, between people in the extent to which they can control or, or trigger phenomena. It's maybe something to do with scepticism is not conducive. So, so, having so, seen, so yeah. I, I arrive, the place goes quiet, yeah. right? Maybe I'm a jinx. <laughs> <laughs> the, having seen their scientific methods, uh, are you in the belief that uh, what they have obtained is, is, is um, credible? Uh, yes, um, uh, in most cases, um, some obviously some phenomena have happened when we've not been expecting it. So maybe one of us is sleeping, or well, you know, for example, the, the the stuff that came from the woods, we were only able to observe from a distance. Right? But generally speaking, they tell it like it is, and I would be able to say for uh, certain phenomena that have been captured, as it were. Uh, yeah, I was there, and the way they're telling it is how, how it happened. Hmm, okay. The, the, you're saying Scotland has, there's much more activity there. This is, doesn't happen here, I don't think, as much, right? Yeah. So you have more experience there. I, I this, is not, this is not unusual for you, in other words. No, no. The, the more extreme stuff in the previous visit, yeah. Yeah, that would be unusual. Yeah. Um, but uh, I, I think uh, that there's a paranormality uh, all around us. It's a, it's a background aspect of life that some people are more sensitive to. And as I say, it, it can be turned up or calmed down according to your response to it. In, in, he, in Scotland, think, yeah, we, yeah. it's the most haunted corner of the world. Yeah. I'm, yeah, I'm a big fan of uh, Scottish paranormality. Yeah. Yeah. This is kind of no big deal for you then, <laughs> I would think no. here. A little bit. Do you think, do you think I went into the yeah. I went into the haunted bedrooms first and second night and was happy to to sleep there and of course nothing happened. Yeah. yeah. Do you think Keith may be the source of some of this? Yeah. Yeah, I think that Keith's reaction to things can magnify the energy, let's say, available, mental, emotional, maybe spiritual, and uh, I think he's uh, changed. Um, he's he's much more clued in now that. A low-key reaction and possibly even divert his attention will calm things. Yeah. You know, to the but to be fair to Keith, yeah. it was him that told me that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the layman would look at all of this equipment, and, and it, you know, it looks it's interesting. If you don't know, you don't know what all this is for. But when you look at all the equipment they're using, are you judging their their methods? I don't judge the methods by their equipment. Um, I looked at the equipment and I, I was reminded of advice that I was given by an, a, a Scottish uh, investigator that the best equipment's between your ears. Um, but if you want to keep a record, if you want to have something for other people to study and to follow on and to know what the story was, you need some way of recording it and there's plenty of options here. And when you've seen the recordings of the voices in the woods, the EVP, um, Skeptics might say, oh, they made that up somehow, they, there was a speaker somewhere. What do you think about it? Well, I, I don't think they made it up in the sense that Don's been very good at showing me upon request his recorder, and I've regularly, uh, frequently, checked it uh, to make sure that it's either completely clean or I know what's on it. So anything else is additional. Um, some of what happened in the woods, I think, is, is intriguing. 
Uh, others I would put down to the wonderful uh, recording equipment that Olympus use, which seems to pick things up quite a mile away. Could be voices from far off. Some of it. Could be yeah. a kind of a mixture but, of the two. Yeah, it could be. But if you get a sensible answer on a recorder to a question you've just posed, um, and the, it wasn't pre-recorded, then that's not picking up random stuff if it happens again and again. Um, one of the frustrating things about Don's EVP work is he very often gets it just on the edge where the reasonable man would say, yeah, I agree that the, those are the words that have been recorded, but a hostile critic would say, no, it's pareidolia. Define that Some. for me. Pareidolia is the ability to see patterns where they don't exist, to attribute meaning to essentially non-meaning signals. Yeah. Yeah. The, and how about the, the fluid on the walls? Your thoughts on that? <clears throat> it reminded me of walls I've seen that have been spat upon. Um, in other words, there could be a way of uh, applying liquid to a wall. But I'm not accusing uh, anyone of doing that. It's just I think that if, sometimes when we're looking for answers, we, we really lack imagination. And I think that we need to analyse that to see is it wood sap, is it a chemical uh, that's red, readily found in houses, or in fact is it quite rare and unusual. Um, it, the, the composition of it might give us a clue to how it came to be there. I thought you were going to ask me about something else. I thought you were going to ask me about the painting upstairs because um, I was not at all sure that that was paranormal. And, uh, and Steve uh, worked uh, through a process of establishing that it was unlikely to be nudged when he passed it. Uh, the timing was a factor. But he also did a vibration test in the wall and there was a significant vibration in the wall when two or three guys went thundering past at speed. So to me, because the, the wall hanging had not been checked just prior to the event, we just have to put a question mark against it. I don't regard it as good evidence of paranormality. What's better evidence of paranormality? is when you get uh, a tripwire or a, a, a laser uh, beam being broken uh, by something physical, and then in another uh, part of the, the, the room, uh, another uh, PIR sensor has been triggered, and you go up and you find the vibration sensor has been moved off the bed, and that these three things are being discovered within seconds of each other, I, I would say because we know there was no one in the room, that, that deserves an explanation and it's very difficult because there's three different types of uh, alarm being set off there and one of them was physically moved. Can you send me that? Do you have some of that that you guys did? Okay. Ultimately, you're here to, um, to uh, I'm, I'm, I'm lost the words, but you're here to... Tell it, tell it, it like it is. You're here to, yeah, to ensure that their methods are accurate and that, that yeah. their scientific method is accurate. Anybody who makes a bold claim in today's world can expect to get hostile criticism. Uh, you know, people who work in this field are very often the subject of character assassination. I've been very fortunate in being a, a voice in Scotland who is known to be careful, conservative, cautious, and uh, nobody's fool. So I've come here at my own expense to see if these guys are telling the truth and so far, they have done exactly what I would have expected and they've come up with results that I can verify. Just not so many results as I'd maybe hoped. Now that's Nick Kyle and he came out on the second visit. Now things had deteriorated somewhat. Phenomena was not happening as much as it was the first visit. But whilst he was there, he did witness things. He talked there just about the vibration detector, how it moved from location, causing alerts on numerous other devices. Simultaneously, within literally within seconds, uh, that was witnessed. There's numerous other things that he'd witnessed whilst he was there. So it was good to have a secondary opinion and an independent observator, uh, observator there to, to make sure that you know, we, we are doing what we say we're doing. Um, Nick will say it exactly as it is, and he did so. Now, what he's talking about, one picture did fall off. There's another picture to like this, just upstairs. Um, and the reason why that fell off is basically because of vibration, we think. Though we can never rule it out, that it might have been a paranormal incident just as we were passing. But nevertheless, um, we could have possibly rule that out as a paranormal. That's one incident we've managed to rationalise. Very sensitive, high, high uh, very high sensitive vibration detectors, which I'm going to replace. One just here and one on the bed frame as well. 
because of reported vibrations. I'm going to leave them as they are, as you can see. And I'm going to shut the door and I'll seal it off. Okay? Now, I did lock the door, seal it off. In other words, put special tape on the door so we know if it's been entered. That vib those vibration detectors, one of them wasn't in its normal place. It alerted whilst we were downstairs in an empty room. We went flying up there, unsealed it, the room, went in, found it not even on the place where we left it, on the floor of all things, upside down. Now that's where we left it, and that's where it was, upside down in alert mode, a foot away from the bed. Now what was interesting, taking into consideration we'd done an EMF sweep already in every single room, this incident, just where this landed on the floor, down here, left an EMF hotspot of almost eight milligauss for about just over three hours, and then bang, disappeared. No apparent reason for it. Is the incident itself seemed to leave a trace evidence behind of an EMF. And like I say, it stayed there for about three hours and vanished. No explanation for it. Uh, the pink ball, yes, that was also seen to have moved. Uh, don't know how it managed to traverse from under the table in the kitchen area to move across the room, but it did without contact from anybody. That caught us off guard. Don went under the floor, took some recordings. That's under the floor of the house, of course. Selected examples of recordings. Some of the ones that we caught, I hear some rings. Sounded like a female. Sounded a bit Irish. Hello. Hmm? Is there a breakthrough that we're having here? What we're finding now is that we know how the human ear works. We check into different things. We look at the cochlear part of the ear and we know this is how we get to hear things. The vibrations through the air harmonics causes the eardrum to rattle and this is what vibrates in the inner ear known as the cochlear. Now there is something called the cochlear implant for people who have hearing deficiencies or can't hear at all. And it passes directly to the, to the side of the head here and connects directly to the cochlea by passing the eardrum completely. We're allowing people to hear, which is interesting because on occasion we found three recorders running simultaneously in a silent environment. I've recorded three different types of voices or two voices and clicks. And it shouldn't do because if it's harmonic, it should all record the same thing and they're not it would seem they are using something referred to as transplacement, transplacing directly to that equipment. In other words, they're placing it directly on that equipment. It isn't in the air. The hence, we get different recordings at the same time on different equipment in a silent environment. But what was interesting here, and the Play Cottages incident, which is another fun and a project episode, we heard someone, a woman, in talking at the time we were recording. We had to... Don went on, oh, bummy neck, press stop, shouted downstairs, thinking it was some of our investigators. Guys, can you be quiet down there? I'm trying to do a recording. Silence. Looked out the window, all our guys are outside, there's nobody else in the building. But I know what I heard. I heard a female voice say a, friend, a sentence. I said to Don, write it down, don't tell me. And they were identical. We heard a woman talk, both of us. But the recorder didn't record it, and it should have done. So how did we hear it? It wasn't, couldn't have been harmonic. Maybe it was transplaced to the individual. Not only did he have the capabilities possibly to transplace into equipment, but also to the inner ear as well. So really, when people do turn around and say, I heard something, John didn't you? And he goes, no, I didn't hear anything. There could be a reason for that. It could be that, yes, their people are targeted directly. Direct information to them. This light, on the landing of keys, fell to the floor, 73.4 inches, I believe it was. Made a, made a loud bang. Interestingly enough, the replication of that sound should have generated around about 39 decibels. It registered around 69 decibels. 
the original sound source was tw tw almost twice as loud as it should have been. Amplified. Is it a real sound? Is it manufactured by the paranormal to make it sound like it, but they don't quite get it right? Or is it just amplified to gain our recognition, to make sure we hear it? Who knows? But the evidence provided there suggests that there's a massive difference between the replicated sound and what it should sound like and the original sound source. Stroboscopic light experiment, very fascinating. We decided to set this up. And it's a motion camera, strobing, there's strobing lights going on, and it's a motion camera. And it picks up something on the landing when there's nobody there. We don't know what it was, but it was something close to the camera, as you can see. There's even somebody that said it looks like there's a pair of lips in it, a pair of lips of all things. I don't know if that's just power dolly, of course. That looks like a pair of lips. People say it looks like a pair of lips. I don't know what that is, but it's got colour. That's interesting. What is it? We've no idea. We've asked questions and gained responses. And yes, see, some of these questions are really the top 10 questions. And we've got answers to questions we've given. This is actual voice phenomena recorded as it happened. I'm not going, to sh not going to share too much of this with you because it'll spoil it for the, uh, the episode, but it's on its way. It's on its way. In November 2015, we received a call from Keith Linder claiming his house was haunted. It transpired we'd be investigated one of the most controversial cases America had ever seen. We went to see Apple and we obtained this information and we calculated what we'd obtained. 237 gigabytes of information in six days. It was an enormous amount of information. We came back, we had to analyze hours and hours and hours of footage. And it was going through that footage, we found things, anomalies, voices, recordings, things that are appearing on camera. We don't know what they are. But what is interesting is that some of the video footage we couldn't even use because it was overlaid with voices. Don comes into me and says, Steve, I need you to say this line. I say this line and I say it clearly in a silent environment only to be record when you play it back that there's something else in the background talking at the same time I am. A ruined piece of footage. Yes, Phenomena Project is probably the only TV series that's throwing out stuff another series would probably use because we had too much of it going on there. It's too unbelievable. Who's going to believe we, had, we came back with 427 recordings of EVP, 288 recordings of actual voice phenomena. No one's going to believe it. They say it's ridiculous. It doesn't exist. Too much of a good thing, you could say. Nevertheless, though, it is on its way. Now, if you want the full details about this, I do have a stall outside um, regarding the, the, the full case and all the details in it. Um, Purposely named the House of Fire and Whispers, as you can well imagine. I wanted to stay away from, you know, the, the terminology that they were using. Um, we didn't want him to splash it all over the cover, the demon house in Seattle. But we had to make a little reference, but the investigation of Seattle Demon House, hence the name from, or generated from Ghost Adventures. There's also the Rochdale Poltergeist case which is the second most prolific case of, the first one I've just done, the second most prolific was the Rochdale, Rochdale Poltergeist case in the UK. And that was absolutely phenomenal. There's details on the book outside as well. It's also available on the internet and at Amazon, places like that. Um, I'm just gonna finish off with the trailer to the series. Um, we first constructed in 2015. We've come into a close now. Season one's completed, the main one, the two-hour episode documentary special flagship version is due to be released at the end of this month. And I'll play the, uh, the trailer. Throughout history, mankind has been searching for the answers to the secrets of the world. 
Visionaries, scientists and scholars have all pondered the same question. Is there an afterlife? An eternal existence which awaits us all beyond our physical being? Or could science finally prove or disprove the existence of the afterlife? Now, for the first time, science and supernatural forces meet head to head as two men take things one step closer to revealing the truth on a journey of scientific paranormal exploration into the unknown. Join renowned paranormal researcher Don Phillips and parapsychologist Steve Mera as they leave no stone unturned on a venture that just might change your life forever. The truth is coming. It's a TV series. It's, you've not gone to see anything like this before. First time it's ever been produced. And the amount of information that we've had, and we have been putting bits out, we've been cornered on, we've been suppressed. We've even been told to take things down. Even the Catholic priest contacted us and said, where have you got some of this information from? This was from an ITC session, guys. He said, get it down, take it down. People shouldn't have that information. We must be putting something out right to gaining this amount of information out there. The, the problems of people coming to us, asking us to take information down, don't distribute certain information. I think we're doing something right. And I think we need to take a change in regarding how we investigate paranormal phenomena and how it's perceived, especially on television nowadays. It isn't a subject to be laughed at. It is a serious subject, and we do need to advance it. And we need to do it properly and the best way, professionally as we possibly can. Um, if anybody wants further information, they can go to the Mappet website. Um, we all Phenomena Magazine, which is a free magazine you can download every month uh, from phenomenamagazine.co.uk. Feel free to pay a visit to Phenomena Project's website, phenomenaproject.tv. There's some details about the episodes there uh, and upcoming things that we're also doing. But it's all available on the Facebook websites as well. So I hope you've enjoyed this, uh, this presentation and um, I hope you enjoyed Phenomena Project and when it comes out. And thank you very much. <laughs>